So Josh and I work at a firm called Lovi and Lovi. Uh, we do like a massive amount of Freedom of Information Act litigation, like 150 cases at a time kind of cases. Um, about five years ago, I left a big corporate law firm. Uh, I had been doing pro bono Freedom of Information Act cases, figured out that I could make like an actual business out of it because, as we'll talk about at the end, if you have to sue the government to get records and you win, then the government has to pay your attorney's fees, which means that people like Josh and I can represent people like you totally for free to fight the government when they won't release your records. So um, I always like to kind of just get a little lay of the land. Um, who considers themselves like, I know a lot about FOIA already? Don't be shy. All right, good. And we can all close our eyes for this one if anyone's embarrassed. Who doesn't really know very much about what the Freedom of Information Act is? All right, so a good mix. So we're gonna go through like the 15 minute version of what normally would be a 90 minute presentation and give you like really high level, this is what the Freedom of Information Act is, this is how it works, and then take questions. Lots of questions would be great. Those can even be questions like, hey, I made this request and this is what happened. Is that crap, can they do that? We can do all those kinds of questions, and I think it's, it's pretty useful. All right, so let's see. Okay, so Josh, what is the Freedom of Information Act? So any person can submit a request to any public body for records, and it can just be written in plain English. It can just say, under FOIA, I want, and then you can just list what you want. You don't need any legalese, you don't need any technical jargon, just plain English, what you want, you just put it out in an email or any other way you want, and they have to give you the records within five to 10 business days. That was like half the slides. <laughs> so it's a law, it, the different states have different laws. We're gonna sort of talk about Illinois, but there's also a federal statute. It's maddening. The federal government is this horrible bureaucracy when it comes to FOIA. It will drive you nuts, but they can be beaten. Um, and basically the reason we have a FOIA statute is this, like there's, it, part of having a good democracy is people have to have access to information, and if you don't, then you can't have a good democracy. So, who can make a FOIA request, Josh? Can, can anyone make a FOIA request? Yes, anyone can make a FOIA request. <laughs> <laughs> what if, um, what if uh, I'm part of like just some organization? Can, can the organization make the request, or does it have to be an individual person? Either way, the individual person can make the request or make the request on behalf of the organization. Both work. And do, if it's an organization, does it have to be like incorporated or can we just like call ourselves citizens for a better government in pick a town? <laughs> Evanston, <laughs> citizens for a better Evanston. I mean, there are advantages to, to being incorporated. Yes, but you can be just a voluntary unincorporated association. You can still make a FOIA request. Do I have to tell them my name? What, what if I don't want them to know who I am? You can make a request entirely anonymously. Don't have to give them any information about yourself. And at all. How would you do that if you were gonna, if you wanted to be anonymous? How would you make an anonymous request? Easiest way is to just go create an email account with some random characters in the email address and just submit the request. <laughs> and little tip: if you, the more it sounds like a name, they they will assume that that is your name, even if it isn't your name. And it, it, there's re, there's reasons why you might want to do that. Sometimes. I get questions from people who are actually government officials who think there's something shady going on where they work, but obviously they don't want like, you know, their employer to know they're making their request. How about the purpose of the request, Josh? Do, do I have to show them that there's like a really good reason why I should have these records? No, nope, you don't need any reason at all. You could be putting the records on your wall to throw darts at them if you want. All right, so uh, any questions about who can make a FOIA request? Yes, sir. You were saying that anyone can make an application towards, I don't think you want to send on that. Uh, send out a FOIA, or can make a FOIA request, but then how do you confirm that that person is in the U.S.? You don't need to be in the U.S. In fact, so different states are different. There are some states where you have to be a resident of the state in order to make a request, and the Supreme Court has said that that's fine, that's, that is, doesn't violate the Constitution, but there's only a handful of states that are that way, uh, and they're mostly like in the Southeast, for the most part, for whatever weird reason. Um, so in Illinois, yeah, you don't have to live in Illinois. You don't even have to be a U.S. citizen. You can be from anywhere. Yes? In those southeast states where you have to be a resident, then you obviously have to give your real name? Uh, that, I don't know. How do you prove that you're a resident without showing Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I don't know how those states handle that. And, and some states might require you to disclose your name. I'm just saying in, in Illinois, 
the, the Illinois Attorney General has, has determined, and I think it's totally correct, that you don't have to identify yourself to make a request. I just wanted to clarify my understanding. Uh, if you don't give your name, then I can't come to you to ask for help with uh, re reviewing a re request, correct? So Josh, what would you say if someone came to us and they made a request with a dummy email address and then they wanted to file suit, what would we do? So we could still file suit and get the, the mic, I think. Oh, the, here. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know you lost your mic. Here, OK. <laughs> So you can still make the FOIA request, and we can still represent you and keep you anonymous if that's what you want. We, we could do that by you know, just using a placeholder name like John Doe, for example, and, and handle it that way, and just say the client wishes to remain anonymous. So it's, it's no issue at all is the bottom line. I think we have done that at least, at least once. Or you could always you know, you could put your name out there at that point is the, is the plaintiff. So The thing is, like, if, if you end up suing and you're the FOIA requester, it, you don't like get deposed. You don't even have to come to court. We have a ton of clients. The vast majority of our clients, like we've never met in person. We don't know. We wouldn't recognize them if they were like walking down the street. And and they just there's it's just pretty much the whole case is against the government. So you as the plaintiff are, you're obviously very important, but you're not really too relevant to the to the analysis. Any other questions on who can make a request? Because then we're going to move on to, who is a public body? Okay, so. Josh, tell us about public bodies. Who's a public body? It's exactly what you think it would be. Everything from police department to you know the the water district, school districts, uh, you know public schools, universities, uh, all different bodies like that. I mean, there's an endless amount of examples. Yeah. So uh, pretty much anything that sounds like government is going to be subject to the Freedom of Information Act in Illinois. Uh, there's a couple exceptions. The judicial branch is outside the scope of that. Uh, there are other laws that govern access to court records. And then there's this weird little gap that I think was unintended where the administrative part of the courts, so the part of the courts that you know, runs the clerk's office or does probation and those kinds of things, which aren't really judicial, because they're under the judicial clause in the Constitution, the courts have said they're not subject to FOIA. So some people are working on trying to fix that legislatively, but there's this weird little gap. Like if you want to know about the inner workings of Dorothy Brown's office, you actually can't, you can't get that through FOIA. Now, Josh, how about private types of entities? What if, what if the government hires a company to do like a really governmental thing? Then what happens then? So if that private entity is performing the governmental function for the government, then they're subject to FOIA as well. We have a big case against Navy Pier, which we've won at the trial court level and is now up on appeal, where they essentially, Navy Pier spun off an entity staffed by all the people that worked at Navy Pier and said, oh, it's totally private now, so totally exempt from FOIA. And we fought that, said they're performing a governmental function. We've won that so far. It's going on appeal, and we'll see what happens in the higher court. But short answer is if it's, they're performing a governmental function, then subject to FOIA. Yep, and it, it gets quirky. You actually have to make the request usually to the government entity who has the contract with them. But if you ever get in that kind of situation, come talk to us. That gets it gets complicated. It's sort of fact specific. Have a question right here. What if by under contract does that have to be like for money? Like what if it is a volunteer organization? Ooh, it does. The money has no part in the analysis. It, it's just whether they're performing the function. Yeah, but it has to be pursuant to a contract. So I suppose you could have a contract with no money changing hands. So that could be the case. Yeah. And then if they're if they're control if the entity is still controlled by the government, then it, it gets like kind of even easier at that point. So anyway, that, that's I, I we raise this just to sort of flag the issue that sometimes you can get records of these kind of pseudo governmental entities or privatized functions, but it's super case specific. But don't don't assume that you can't get stuff that way. We got a question over here. Going to the um, nonprofit associated, if a city hires a, no, if the city enlists the help of a friend's organization and then strictly does not create the legal documentation, although gives them money, would that make the, not money to run, but money that was donated to the city and given to the nonprofit, would that make the nonprofit foyable? Uh, well, we would look at, is the nonprofit being controlled by the government? Well, first we would look, is there a contract between 
the government and the entity. And if there is, and the function is governmental, and that's a little squishy what exactly is governmental or not, then you would, could have access to records there. Alternatively, if there's not a contract, but the entity is con was like created by government, controlled by government, if its board is the majority of the board or government officials, in that kind of scenario, then potentially that entity is what we call a subsidiary body. It's sort of an extension of the government. But I can't stress enough, these are incredibly fact specific. So it really depends on the exact circumstances. And if it's a seven member board and there's three government officials versus four government officials, that can make a big, actually make like a big difference. All right, so uh, we've talked about who can make a request and where you can make a request to. Josh, what, what are public records? Like, what, how does that fit into this? What is a public record? Pretty much everything you can think of as a public record, from paper to uh, emails and text messages to videos to audio recordings. Uh, we, you know, we've done a lot of getting police shooting videos released. We you know, got the mayor's so-called private emails released. We, so if you can think of it, it's probably a record. How about this? What's this transaction of public business all about? What is that kind of element? What does that mean? Transaction of public business is what determines if the record is subject to disclosure under FOIA. So think the, the, the mayor's private email case. You can't just set up a Gmail account, conduct all of your business on a Gmail account, and then magically say it's not subject to FOIA. If what you're doing pertains to your job, if it pertains to transacting public business, it's subject to FOIA. And so that's how, that's how the mayor's emails on a, on a non-governmental email account had to be released. And in that case, there, there became some kind of back and forth about the line between, it was really interesting, the line between what's the transaction of public business and what is like campaign and political activities. And sometimes those, you know, that line wasn't always like completely clear. And so that was a big part of that case as we were sort of working through where those lines were um, in what was, so, the, polling data, for example, you know, discussions of polling data, that was not the transaction of public business. Discussions of the polling data, but then what policies should the mayor advocate for as a result of that, and I don't even remember if that was specifically a thing that there was, but then now it's more like transaction of public business. Usually this isn't an issue. It's more of an issue in like the private email kind of context where the lines can be a little bit blurry, but for the most part, if it, the government official is sending the email in the course of their business or their work as a public official, then it's going to relate to the transaction of public business. And don't read too much into transaction. So it doesn't literally mean buying and selling things. That it's sort of it's very broadly construed. Okay, so this is about exemptions. Um, so everything so far sounds great, right? Anyone can make a request public bodies, like anything kind of governmental, even sometimes private entities, public records, anything about public business. So it's all good up until right now. And now it gets bad because they're not bad, but it gets way less good because there's a long list of what are called exemptions. That means legal bases laid out in the statute that say, except they don't have to produce any of these 95 categories of records or the hundreds that are derivative of other statutes that have secrecy provisions in them, right? Sometimes it makes really good sense. Social security numbers, right? You're, I guarantee you, well, I shouldn't guarantee you, but most likely there's some government document that's got your social security number on it, right? I mean, there's certainly a federal document that would have that, or driver's license numbers, or stuff like that, right? Health information. Makes sense why that wouldn't be disclosed, right? But then there's, a, then there's a lot of other stuff. This deliberative process exemption basically says if government officials are kicking around an idea back and forth and expressing opinions to reach a policy decision, strange as it might sound, you don't get to see those. They get to basically deliberate in secret and then just reach a decision. The idea is, and I don't agree with it, but the, the thinking behind it was we want government officials to be able to speak freely when they're deliberating and not worry that their views are ever going to come to light. I guess there's a little theoretical kind of basis for that, but that gets so overused, like tremendously overused. So some states have actually, at least Florida's gotten rid of that. There's law enforcement related exemptions. There's stuff on trade secrets and proposals and bids. Um, there's stuff on like kind of data security. That gets super overused. They just, you know, the, some, some IT person, some government IT person will 
submit an affidavit like, oh, we can't give you the database schema because then you could hack our system if you knew the schema of the database. Does any, we have some IT people here. Does anybody think that that makes sense? No. Right? I mean, it's, right, so that's the kind of, our world, we live in this world a lot. Sometimes in the other stuff, but it, we're usually dealing with this. Like, is it exempt or not? But government's got to prove that the record's exempt, okay, by what's called clear and convincing evidence. It's like a heightened standard of evidence because there's a presumption that all records are going to be disclosed unless the government can prove one of the exemptions. We narrowly construe the scope of the exemptions. So if it's unclear what the scope is, you go with like the narrowest reasonable scope. And there's a bunch of other doctrines like that that are meant to, at least on paper, make it harder for the government to withhold records. So all that means is, in theory, the statute defaults to favoring the requester, defaults to you get your records unless the public body is able to overcome that default of you just get what you want. Who gets to decide whether a request is frivolous or, like, if I ask for the word, like, uh, some re a request may be completely unreasonable. Sure, I can, you want, go ahead, you want to talk about, I guess, who decides whether records can be withheld and maybe we could talk about undue burden kind of a little bit. Yeah. So initially the public body responds to the request and they would deny your request and they're required to specify the reasons why they denied the request. Now just because they deny it and tell you the reasons that they base their denial on doesn't mean that those reasons are legitimate at all in which case you could then file a suit and go to court and ultimately it'll be a judge saying yes the records are exempt or no they're not. And you mentioned sort of frivolous or unreasonable so um, we'll just sort of skip ahead to this but one of the one of the responses the government can give you is your request is unduly burdensome meaning it's asked for too many too much records and the burden involved in producing them outweighs the public interest in disclosure. That gets overused like crazy. Um, you know, a couple key things to keep in mind, the, the public interest can outweigh the burden of, of complying with the request. So it might take a week or two weeks to compile the records for a request, that, or even longer. That doesn't necessarily mean it's unduly burdensome. And then a really important thing to keep in mind is if they blow the deadline and don't respond on time, then they've waived the right to assert undue burden. And I'll give you two huge examples of that. One, I did a case, a bunch, I don't know if this is when you were with me yet or not, Josh, but it, someone had asked for every village email over like an eight year time period. It was like, like everyone's email, right? <laughs> and, they, and they blew it off and they didn't respond and then they, and our client followed up and stuff, they still didn't, so we ended up suing and yeah, we're like, judge, they waived it, they can't complain, I don't care if it's gonna take them you know, all this money and time to do it, this is what we want, and, and the judge agreed. And we ultimately still negotiated something, but it was like thousands and thousands of emails. And then, you wanna talk about the, the sure. CR case? Yeah, so there was, oh, I was gonna talk about a different one, actually, but sure. there was, pick, there pick was a, another case, so undue burden is, is essentially where the public body says it's too much work, so we don't have to give you the records. This case, a requester had sought uh, all fatal police-involved shooting videos by Chicago police over time over a five-year time period from 2011 to 2016, and they just blew the deadline. And they came into court and said it would literally take our department four years of full-time work to produce the, all those videos. And they blew the deadline, and the judge just made them produce it. And we also saw no evidence that they ever had to shut down at all to produce them. Yeah, it didn't take four years, and it didn't shut down the, the entire Chicago Police Department. <laughs> yeah, it, it I mean, didn't it happen. took a while. I think it took maybe a year to 18 months on a rolling basis for all of it to be to be released. But yeah, so okay. So I hope that addresses your question, sir. Um, what do we have next? Okay, how do I make a FOIA request? It's it's not nearly as complicated as you might think it is. Um, you know, go on the internet and you're going to find the where to make the request kind of stuff. Um, you'll find an email address, you'll send an email, the subject line can be FOIA request, and all you really gotta say is, under FOIA, I request copies of the following things, and then list them out. And you have to reasonably describe the records. So that's, there's no bright line for what that means. It, on the one end of the spectrum, it can be the you know, contract number 13-CV-24 that was entered on this date, like a super specific thing. It could be all records related to your decision to do X, Y, or Z. That usually would reasonably describe the records depending on 
how complex that is. Or you can just do all emails on this time period between these people with these keywords and you can make it like super objective. So there's a lot of different ways you can describe the records. The best way to get good at this is just start doing it. And then you'll get responses, you'll get denials, you'll get responses that say this is vague, I didn't understand this or that. Or, and then you'll learn and you'll sort of refine over time and you'll get better at it to really kind of zeroing in. You also don't have to take it all at once. I mean, you can make a request, get some documents, and then do follow-up requests. It doesn't all have to be at once. Yeah, so if they don't understand your request or you only get some of the records you want and not all of them, the worst case scenario is that you then send another FOIA request. I mean, there's really nothing bad that can happen from sending one and not having it be perfect the yeah. first time. Now, if you rack up enough requests, then you can be labeled what's called a recurrent requester and they can take an extended time period. And the statute lays out how many that is. But if you make a lot of requests, you can you, you may want to sort of measure it out, but there, it's a pretty high number. So that, that doesn't apply if you're a journalist or with correct, an organization. or nonprofit right. and things like that. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about like data and format and that kind of stuff. So you can definitely make a request that says, "I want you to query the database for these things." And if if you know what they're says, you can say, "I want you to type, you know, these SQL commands into this line and give me the results." And I hope I didn't butcher the language on it, but I think that's right. So I mean, you can you can give them very specific what you want. Um, or varying degrees of that. And you can then specify, I'd like it as a CSV file or an Excel file or something like that. Sometimes the databases are in these, you know, like these kind of proprietary databases where you might not have the software. The law says if it's in an electronic format, you can specify the format you want the data in so long as it's feasible to do that. And if it isn't, then you either get it in paper or in the native format at your, at your choosing. So some, one thing that'll happen, I have a client who uh, has a, a public um, salary database. So they FOIA all over the state for payroll data and they put it into a big payroll database if you wanna look up you know, what public salaries are. And so they'll make the request and every year there's a couple entities around the state and they change every year who will ask for it in Excel and they'll give it to us in PDF which is a huge pain when you're trying to make a database, right? And sometimes you can even see when you look at the properties that it started as Excel and they converted it to PDF, like deliberately. So they can't, that's not how it works. You specify the format as long as it's feasible, they, they have to give it to you that way. One of the first bigger FOIA cases I did years ago, um, IDOT produced a spreadsheet and they locked the spreadsheet so you could only view it and print it. And we had to go, we, we won and then went up on the appellate court and we won again to establish that they can't do that. They can't lock the data. They were making all these arguments about you could manipulate the data or do things like that. And that's just not a defense. It's not in the statute. So, okay. So that's how you make a FOIA request. These are just some examples of different ways you can do it. I think we've sort of touched on this already. All, all documents related to you know, sometimes that can be too broad or too, or too vague, but, but it's a good place to start if you want. It can be very specific. We talked about parameter-based. I think we've kind of covered all this. Just two other little, th oh, you can't ask questions, right? So Josh, if I made a request that says, I'd like to know how many police cars you have, what, what response would you expect to get? Uh, we don't have to answer questions, so we don't have to give you anything. They could also just ignore the request entirely if they wanted to. But the recommendation that we usually make, the easiest way to handle that is whenever you have a question and you want to phrase it as a records request, you just say, please produce records sufficient to show whatever it is you're interested like in. Like how many police cars do you have? So it's not how many police cars do you have, it's please produce records sufficient to show how many police cars you have. Get the, there's a big difference. It's a huge, it doesn't sound like a big difference, but in FOIA world, that's a, a tremendous, that's the bit, like one of the biggest differences that there is. They also don't have to create new records for you, but running a database query, the, even if it's like for specific fields, even if they didn't already have the, that search result, that is not the creation of a new record. So that's important to know. And then two last things I have that are usually really interesting. Whatever the thing is that you're interested in, ask for the policies and procedures related to that thing. If it's you know approval of zoning requests or something, don't just ask for the, the zoning papers for a zoning change. Also ask for the policies and procedures related to that. So you can learn the language of what kind of paperwork there is. And then you know, oh, it's a 465 report. So I want all the 465 reports 
for the last two years, right? Then there's like, there's not a lot of room to screw around if you can talk in their language. And then report studies, analyses, stuff like that. So like if you think something is going on in government that you don't think is a good idea or they're not watching something, ask for report studies, analyses of whatever that issue is. That's an example where the absence of records might be the most interesting thing to you, right? Conflicts of interest, right? All studies and reports about conflicts of interest and they've never done any studies. It's not a great example, but it's not a bad one. Okay. Uh, Josh, when do they have to respond and what, how does that work? I think you touched on it earlier. Public body has five business days to respond. They can take an extension within those five days to make it 10 business days. So a total of two weeks effectively for them to get back to you on your request. And that's if they take the extension. And what kind of cert, what's the sta standard that determines the kind of search that they have to do? They have to perform a reasonable search for records. So they have to look anywhere where the records are likely to be. They can't, they can't not look somewhere where they know there's probably going to be records and then say, oh, well, we checked this one spot and it wasn't in this one file cabinet, so you're out of luck. And this, so that can sometimes mean checking you know, 11 different offices around the state if they know that's where the records are going to be. If they know that there's four people who know about this type of thing, they got to go talk to those four people. How about if the, you wanted f uh, files from an old case from Chicago Police Department and they said they searched in the place where the records are supposed to be, what would you say to that? Uh, just because the records are supposed to be kept somewhere doesn't mean that they don't know they're likely to be somewhere else. And Chicago Police Department in particular has a history of quote unquote street files, which was police officers just keeping records at their house in their basement and their personal possessions and they know that happens and they know that that's relatively common. So they would have to go, they'd have to go there and look and ask those officers. And that's sort of, that's where it falls into, it depends on what judge we draw if when we file a suit as to how, like how far will they make them go. But often on this issue with the Chicago Police Department in particular, our clients will make a request, there will be a search of where the records are supposed to be. Client knows there's things that are missing, even specific things that are missing. They'll follow up, the police department just doesn't really even respond at all. We file suit, the law department now gets involved because they represent the city in the suit. Then they go back and look like, oh yeah, we found like four more boxes of documents. Like, thank you, that's what we were trying to say in the first place. What if they just don't respond, Josh? Can they just like deny you forever by not responding? No, if they don't respond to the request, then that's considered a constructive denial and you can then file suit and, and they'll lose for not responding. And then at that point, they've waived undue burden. So no matter how much you requested, no matter how much work it would be, even if it would be four years of full-time work, they still have to produce those records. And the idea is like, if you don't even have the courtesy to respond to the public when they ask for records, then we're not going to let you complain about how much work is involved. So that's the really other thing idea. is, if they, if they fail to respond within that deadline, then they also can't charge you fees for anything. It's, it's, it's a bad look for them when they don't respond to you at all. Yeah. Oh, fees. Yeah. So we didn't, I don't have it in the slides here, but they can charge you for copying. The, and you can get a waiver if it's in the public interest, but the easiest thing to do is just ask for everything as PDFs or other electronic format, including if they're paper documents, just ask them to do a scan and give them to you as PDFs, and then you really should have a pretty trivial amount of copying charges, if at all. Uh, if it's a large volume of data, then there's this weird provision that hardly anyone understands where like it can, it, I, think, it, I think it's a low amount, I think it's, it's like over 100 megabytes it gets to like the up to $100 or something like that. But it's only for like a very discreet, weird kind of request. So you might run into that, but probably you won't. All right, so what happens then if your request is denied, Josh? What, what are some of your options? So if your request is denied, then you could try reformulating your request. But if it's a bad denial, you can go to the attorney general who the public access counselor who would then issue an opinion. Now, 99.9% .9 of those opinions are non-binding, which means the public body can just ignore them entirely. And the whole process can take potentially, you know, like a couple of years. But if it's denied, I'd say the real answer to actually getting your records is to file a lawsuit. Josh, are you suggesting that there's public bodies who don't do what the attorney general tells them the law is? It's, that can't be right. That just can't be true. 
it's pretty standard that the public bodies ignore what the attorney general says <laughs> to the point that they won't even respond when the attorney general contacts them a lot of times. They just flat out ignore the attorney general. And some public bodies are really bad and notorious for you know, just not complying with the law. Chicago Police Department, uh, Chicago Public Schools, a couple recurring offenders right there that, that it happens a lot with. So I, sometimes the PAC can be a useful process. Some people have had good luck, but it, it can take a long time. And the problem is you, you're not, you, you very well might be right back to where you started. Like under Rauner, they did, could care less what, what Lisa Madigan had to say about FOIA, and they would just ignore them. So, and they're not the only ones. There were lots that did that. Now, do I have to go to the public access counselor, though, Josh? Is that required? No, you don't have to go to them at all. You, don't, you never have to engage with the public access counselor or the attorney general. You can go, you can go straight to filing suit. Right. The, so uh, if you, what can happen in a lawsuit then, Josh? Well, in a lawsuit, the judge can order them to produce the records. And when you win, that's your attorneys, the public body has to pay the attorney's fees. So they have to pay us so you know, we're able to represent you for free. There's also penalties under FOIA. So if they violate the statute in bad faith, then in addition to having to pay the attorney's fees to the plaintiff, they have to pay the penalties. So they don't respond to your request, they just completely ignore you. Well, that's bad faith in our opinion and that warrants penalties under FOIA. And there's lots of other conduct that can warrant penalties. What, what kind of penalties are you talking about? We're talking uh, $2,500 to $5,000 per penalty, per bad faith violation. That is our last slide. And I think this is our email address. Um, goes to our whole team uh, that does this stuff. So anytime, if you have questions, if you got a denial, you're not sure if it's a good denial, if you just kind of want a little guidance, please don't hesitate to contact us. Yes, question. So, so I have the perfect FOIA request. It's going to get passed. Um, and uh, only it's, it's data that's, top, that's uh, um, chronologically topic, topical. Um, and I, I, and I want them to produce, reproduce this data on a monthly or quarterly or yearly basis. Uh, does, is there anything in the law that allows for that? And a follow-up to that would be, can we ask for it in a website? Well, let me do the first one. So you, you can't do like a standing request. You, you'd have to reissue the request each time. Like, because, and to be fair, like, I don't know how they would keep track of those, but you can ask them and maybe they'll, they'll do that. It depends on the entity, but, but usually they would. I, I didn't quite follow the last about a website. Well, the alternative to that would be that they, uh, they actually just, you ask for that to be in the public record and they, uh, and they create a website. Right. For them to yes. Be in the Great question. I mean, in an ideal world, when they produce records to one person, they would just put, I mean, in, in a really ideal world, they would put almost every single record they have on a website for you to immediately access. But that world doesn't exist, probably won't exist. But if you, in, in federal FOIA, there's actually a rule now that if three, P, if three requesters have asked for the same thing, then they have to put it on a website. But you can't, you can't like make them do, and Illinois doesn't have that provision, but you can't say, I want you to post this. You would hope that they would start to do that, but you can't make them do that. So we're going to do some questions from the document, but f please first uh, give a round of applause. Thank you. I saw some hands up. Um, I'll get to you in just one second, but we have a few questions on the doc. I want to make sure we get to them. Um, are there estimates of the cost of FOIA requests to taxpayers? I guess like, at a national level, I suppose. Or like how much does FOIA compliance cost the taxpayers? I believe that's what the question is. That may be a question from a government official. I'm not okay. sure. Um, no, I don't. I don't know that there. I don't know that there is an answer to that question. Um, I, I know that there are some public bodies who, when they start to get annoyed at requesters, will start to put a FOIA log online that also has an estimate of how much that FOIA request costs them to comply with. There are a few entities that were messing around with that. I'm not sure how accurate any of that was. I'll tell you that I have FOIA'd the federal government, various agencies. Because the, the federal government is like, they're way behind, they have a massive backlog, right? And they always complain they don't have enough money. And when I FOIA'd them for any memos or documents talking about how much money do they need and are they going to ever ask for it, they never seem to have any records about that. So. And one more from the doc before we go back to the audience. 
Um, when a government agency has to pay a penalty, who are they paying to? That gets paid to the requester. To the requester, okay. Correct. Um, okay, so I saw some, a hand here, saw a hand here, and I see a hand back there, so we're gonna do one, two, three, then we might go back to the document. So, um, I've filed about six FOIAs in Evanston. Every single one has been improperly denied and they've landed in the AG's office. This is since last October. Honestly, I think that's a black hole, the AG's office. What is a person to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can talk to us, and uh, we, get, we don't get quite as backlogged as the Attorney General's office, but we do sometimes get a little bit backlogged, so it does take a little patience. But um, yeah, I, you, you can't do much to make the Attorney General's office go any faster. They just have, I, they're under, I mean, they, I think they, when they set up the Public Access Counselor, they vastly underestimated how many requests for review there were gonna be, and that's because they vastly underestimated just how bad the compliance was. <laughs> so so the, the answer, I mean, the, the answer is usually file a lawsuit, and, it, and that does tend to move a lot more quickly than, uh, than the Public Access Counselor. Unless sometimes you get dug in for a fight that might go on appeal and it might it might be you know it could be years to resolve and then one more question sure so once you engage an attorney then the the um ag's office washes their hands of it yeah what, once you file the lawsuit then the attorney general's office is no longer even allowed under the statute to process it anymore so i do a lot of work with uh state agencies uh specifically with health and human services and a lot of their um rfp processes or closed bid, can even in a closed bid process, can we apply for a FOIA request to get the responses to a closed bid response? So re the law on proposals and bids is, um, so long as the bidding process is open, like they haven't made a final selection yet, then they can withhold the proposals and bids. Once they've made a final selection, then they have to release all the bids. Potentially some things could be redacted as trade secrets, but that's gonna be like some pieces of it. When you say closed bid, you mean it was just one bidder, so it wasn't even really like a bid? No, I just mean closed to a, a list, particular list of uh, vendors. Gotcha, but yeah. To your, just as a follow-up to what you said, that they have to release it under FOIA, or they just, they're supposed to release it on their own? No, if someone makes a FOIA request for proposals and bids once the final selection's been made, then they have to produce the proposals and bids. There's no automatic disclosure rule, as far as I know. So this seems like a, an amazingly progressive law, if you think about it. Where does it come from? Like, what's the, what's the history of how we have a whole nation of states that do this? That's a good, that's a great question. Um, so, it kind of starts back at the federal level, I think in like the, it may go even back to 20s and 30s, but certainly like the 50s, 60s, 70s, there, there were various statutes where you could get access to public records, but they were like really vague and easily abused. So I think the first federal FOIA what statute was like under Johnson, uh, and that was sort of the birth of the movement, I guess, so to speak, but it was still pretty bad. And then I think it was under Ford there were like significant amendments that Ford vetoed and Congress overrode. Um, so it kind of goes back to that sort of post-World War II time period. And then it sort of rolls out to different, to different states. There, there's been in the past sort of this like common law, non-statutory right of access to some government records in some situations, but the idea of having like a statutory regime to govern it in an orderly fashion goes back, you know, really to kind of 60s, 70s. Illinois was one of the last. I think it was maybe like early 80s, very early 80s. Uh, following up to uh, his question, uh, can you uh, FOIA grant applications for governmental entities? I think a grant application would probably be treated basically the same as a proposal and bid. Um, and so if it's a, comp well, yeah, if it's a competitive grant, if you got, you know, multiple, yeah, I, I, I think that would be the same as a, a, a contract proposal, yeah. Okay, um, one from the doc. Uh, do you represent government agencies at all? Uh, we do not, but if a, government, if a government agency made a FOIA request to another government agency and they wanted to, and they weren't satisfied with the response, 
once we got appropriate conflict of interest waivers to make sure that we, it, we wouldn't be precluded from being adverse to that public body in the future, then I think we would entertain it. But we don't do defense side. So we only represent requesters. We don't represent government trying to withhold records from people. So I made a pretty bad FOIA request in college. I asked the CTA for all of their complaint data, and they asked me to be more specific, and I said, the past years of complaint data on trains and buses, and they still said to be more specific, and at that point I gave up. So like, what's the burden of like specificity? If, like, I don't know what data they have. What is the burden of specificity I have to provide as a requester? I'm gonna give this to you, Josh, but at first I'm gonna note that a shocking amount of time I've, I've seen FOIA responses that say, we don't know what you mean by complaints. <laughs> Un unpack that for a minute. <laughs> I would say at that point, you've pretty much, you've gotten to the level of specificity you need realistically. I mean, you could always have some more back and forth with them to try to work it out, but I suspect they just didn't want to comply with the request and they were using that as a reason to hope you would go away and it sounds like you went away. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I was working for a company that was collecting elections results data and like GIS data, but mostly election results, which I believe are legally supposed to be like open access if you like, either they'll be online or you have to just request them and they'll give them to you. When governments don't believe me when I say that they have to do it, is there like a way to gently threaten without making a FOIA request or should I just be like making FOIA requests? to get my results. <laughs> you should definitely make the FOIA request to get the records you want because until you invoke the statute, they have no legal requirement to, to give you anything. Yeah, other than uh, like some law, uh, the election statute might have its own disclosure provisions on top of it. Like sometimes there are some other things like that. But just in general, um, there's no problem trying to informally get things, but just understand that you don't really have a right you can enforce yet until you've made the formal request and then it gets a, then there's a clock that's ticking and then there's remedies that you have if you're unsatisfied with the results. If you're part of a municipality, can you FOIA the legal department? Like who does the legal department represent in the city? Uh, well, the, a lawyer for any sort of corporate entity, including a government entity, represents the entity. It doesn't represent the individual decision makers or the individual board members. It represents the entity, but obviously the entity directs the law firm, you know, through its board of directors or through its mayor. However, that's all kind of kind of set up. Um, you, if if it sounds like part of your question is, if I'm a public official or or a trustee and I want to get information about my own town. How does that work? Under FOIA, you have, this, you have no greater or lesser rights than anyone else. And I don't think there actually is any statutory or constitutional right to information that you have as an elected official. And I think somebody introduced a bill, I don't think it, it went anywhere that was, because this comes up a lot in, in where public official, like elected officials on a board would have certain rights to access uh, uh, to information that they need in order to do their jobs. So, that, so basically, if you wanted to, if you were an elected official, and you wanted to FOIA your own law department, you'd be treated basically the same as anyone else. Awesome. Thank you so much. Give it up one more time. For that Thank you. Thank you so much.